Good afternoon. I will take this with me. Um, today we have with us um, uh, two very important and very relative people that is working um, uh, in similar issues that we are working. Uh, and it's great uh, to bring people from different disciplines uh, and find common uh, points of research. Uh, it's Usman Hake. Usman Hake is not from other discipline. He's an architect. Um, uh, but he's very much into different kind of projects related with interaction and real-time data. And uh, Natalie Zeremizenko. Uh, that she's coming from New York and she's a visual artist. Um, uh, they were supposed to have the conference together, but Natalie is feeling a bit dizzy, so we will start with Usman, and then uh, Natalie will join us uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, for the ones that they don't know uh, some things about them, I will read a, a bit of their bio. Uh, Usman Hake is the founder of Pachube, a real-time data infrastructure for the Internet of Things, used by tens of thousands of people, including us. Uh, around the world. Uh, it acquired the Log Main uh, Inc. in 2011. Uh, trained as an architect, he has created responsive environments, interactive installations, digital interface devices, and dozens of mass participation initiatives. He received uh, the 2008 Design of the Year Award, Interactive, uh, from the Design Museum in UK, and a 2009 World Technology Award uh, in Art. Uh, Natami Natalie Jeremijenko, um, she is named one of the most influential women in technology 2011 and one of the inaugural top YAC innovators by MIT uh, Technology Review. Uh, she directs the Environmental Health Clinic uh, and is an associate professor in the visual art development at uh, New York University and affiliated with the Computer Science uh, Department and Environmental Studies Program. Uh, Usman Hake and Natalie, uh, they are leading a workshop together with our students uh, since Monday and, and tomorrow during midday we will have like a short uh, presentation of what they have been working with during those days, so you're all welcome to join. Um, so, uh, Usman, uh, thank you very much for being here with us, and please welcome Usman and Natalie, that she will be coming in a while. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction. I'm, uh, I'm just going to plug in my computer, so just one second. Okay, thanks, thanks everyone. Um, thank you for coming. I'm, uh, I'm going to give a, uh, a talk about the projects I've been doing over the last 12 years or so. Um, and then Natalie's going to talk a little bit about her work, and uh, in particular a project that, that we did together recently in Toronto called Flight Path. What I'd like to do in my first part of the presentation is just describe um, a variety of projects, not in that much detail, but ended up with a description of some of the strategies that I that I think have helped me, that I've kind of picked up over the over the years. Um, uh, I, I call this the the sort of notes on the design of participatory systems. Um, so yeah, I, I was trained as an architect. And uh, everything I do, I still consider part of my architectural profession. In, in a sense, I am trying to contribute to the discourse around architecture. Um, and that's how I have sort of self-identified, if you like, as an architect. Although a lot of my work often falls into this sort of other category of art. The thing that I've been, that has kind of motivated almost all my work 
started from this image that I came across uh, about 15 years ago. It's in a publication called uh, Boundary Layer Climates uh, by T.R. Oke. And he actually took the image from a book called The Climate Physiology of the Pig. Now what you see are, it's the same piglets in the same box. But on the right hand side, the temperature has been increased by a few degrees. So what's happened is this very small change in what you might call the program of the space, or a very small change in, in, the, in the kind of software of the space, has altered the social relationships of all of the creatures inside. It's that small change that I was most interested in. How could I harness these kind of programmatic change to actually start to work with the social relationships that define how people relate to each other and also to their spaces around them. That's not to say that I wasn't interested in this kind of physical fabric um, or that I think that this is architecture but the physical fabric is not. It just so happens that this is the thing I wanted to understand best. And so a lot of my work has been to try and probe the idea of this kind of software of space as I, as I used to call it. Which is basically to think about architecture not as the walls and roof and the floor and these kind of physical things, but everything inside, everything that's going on inside, the sound, the smell, the light, the temperature, the electromagnetic fields, the social relationships, all of these things that go together to make up our experience of space. And so these projects, in one way or another, try and probe these, these aspects and try and make propositions for these things. Skyer was a project that I uh, first started working on um, in 1999 when I was an artisan residence in Japan where I had a beautiful studio that was very far removed for the, from the rest of the school and really the only way to communicate was by mobile phone and in this studio the mobile phone signal only worked at one end of the room and not at the other end. And so I used to keep the mobile phone on a table, not where my desk was, which was in a lovely area in the light. And every time the phone rang, I had to get up and go and answer it on the other end of the room, which was kind of defeating the purpose of the mobile phone in the first place. Um, and I began to think of this kind of this electromagnetic space, what Tony Dunn has referred to as the Hertzian space as a kind of a physical manifestation of something that was requiring me and urging me to behave spatially in much the same way that walls and, and corridors and doorways do. And so I wanted to try and get a, an understanding of what was going on with this Hertzian space. And so I started doing, just with my mobile phone, looking at the number of sig signal levels, you know, the number of bars, and walking around the room and trying to build up these maps of what was going on. And I very quickly discovered that actually it changes all the time. It was changing from, from almost from minute to minute. And, um, and so this Hertzian space also had a time dimension. Now, this project actually became a five-year project. So uh, I'm going to hop along about two years here, where I, at this stage, made a proposal to create a, a grid of a thousand electromagnetic sensors, basically um, uh, radio coils that would respond to electromagnetic fields of a variety of frequencies that would be propelled into the sky by balloons and the balloons would light up to reveal something about the Hertzian characteristics as it swooped upwards. And the whole point about wanting to make it rise up into the sky was that rather than just putting it on the ground, I, I wanted to understand the 3D volume of this electromagnetic space. Now, as some of the, the workshop participants uh, have probably deduced by now, I'm, I'm not that interested in merely a linear data visualization of that Hertzian space. And so what I wanted to do was actually understand how it is that people could affect that representation of the electromagnetic fields. And so my proposal was to take this grid of a thousand helium balloons, which is about 30 meters wide, embed it with mobile phones, so that when this cloud floats up into the sky, you can phone into it, and you can listen to the electromagnetic fields up there, because we'll convert the electromagnetic fields to audio frequencies, 
but the act of calling generates more electromagnetic fields and so you're trying to listen to this thing but you change what you're looking at through the act of trying to observe it. And so in a sense the audience becomes the performer of this thing that they are trying to, to watch. Fast forwarding again a couple of years, a thousand grant applications um, uh, and uh, several thousand experiments. Uh, finally got a chance to build and deploy this thing in um, Greenwich Park in London which is as some of you may know it's where GMT, the line of GMT is and the reason for trying to do it there was that I had this idea that I would replicate this around the world in every single time zone and try and get a, an electromagnetic carving of the entire planet. Um, but this was the first time I did a project that necessarily had to involve the public. I was actually not that interested in public participation before this project but it was such an expensive project and my budget was so limited that I needed the public to help me inflate this thing, um, to help me assemble it. I enlisted my neighbors, I enlisted some of my students, um, and then every time we did the experiments in the parks, people would come and ask us, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? You know, when is, it, when is the real thing going to happen? Can I come and, come and be part of that? Which was great, because it actually took a team of about 50 people to assemble, deploy this, and then nine people alone just to fly it in the sky. Um, <coughs> Do we have some audio? Is there audio up? I heard some audio, but um, it's not so important. This is just a very, the very first project where, uh, where I built something that was large, that was spectacular. Even though I hadn't really intended to do something visual, it became this very spectacular cloud that floated up about 50, 60 meters into the, into the, into the air. Um, now you'll notice that all of the people are here behind a line um, and they're using their mobile phones and they're triggering this uh, triggering patterns in this cloud and the, the thing was that so many people said oh I wish I could fly it myself of course I'd had to train nine people to fly this thing because at a, at a a diameter of 30 meters, this thing could potentially have one ton of wind load on it. So it was a very complex thing to fly. And I've skipped ahead over a lot of the experiments we did to learn how to fly basically a 30 meter kite. Um, but the, the problem was that the members of the public, the one thing that they really wanted to do was to be able to fly it, to be part of that process of actually creating the spectacle, not just effectively just triggering these electromagnetic patterns. So that was, that was something I sort of picked up from this project. It didn't quite achieve what I wanted it to. So I'm going to skip that for a second and just jump to Open Burble to, because this project was basically a reformulation of Sky Air to try and take account of this desire I'd noticed in the members of the public to be part of not just the assembly process, not just the design process, but also actually to create the spectacle. So I redesigned the, 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 the structure of Sky Air, which had been this carbon fiber lattice uh, with a, a thousand helium balloons into something that was more of a sort of Lego kit, if you like, that could be assembled into various patterns by members of the public. They could basically snap these together on site and they would themselves go through a process of trying to identify what is a good pattern. You know, they, there would be no instruction from me to explain what they should be building. It's simply presented to them as a kind of kit of parts to assemble something that will be big, basically. And the idea here was that usually in a normal, you know, normal people, that means non-architects, um, think of the city as this kind of static thing out there that they just inhabit. And I wanted to explore this notion that the city is actually something that you build and you constantly rebuild, that everyone is a part of the building of the city. And to basically, even if it's only just for one night, to offer the chance for people to build something so large that it's as big as the skyscrapers, skyscrapers on their horizons. 
Um, and in this, I was really sort of tapping into the, the uh, if you're familiar with the story of Jack and the Beanstalk, this idea of doing something in your, in your own backyard that just grows into something huge. So again, fast forwarding many dozens of experiments in parks and uh, sort of working with lots of members of the public. This was the, this was the sort of unit that I just described that people could start to assemble. Um, here are some people assembling them. We did this in 2006 in Singapore. Um, and so here they're assembling it, they're inflating it, and then they're also controlling it because they're the ones who are flying it. There's basically a a 50 meter handlebar down at the bottom of this structure and it's segmented and it's embedded with basically the same accelerometer sensor that you have in a Nintendo Wii. Um, in fact we had a lot of difficulty getting those sensors because the Wii was coming out at about the same time and Nintendo had bought out all of this particular uh, 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 board. Um, and the idea was that this had nothing to do with electromagnetic fields, um, but it did reuse the balloon sensors that I had before. As people, having basically designed the pattern of this and the, and the form of this balloon, they could then in real time, by shaking, by rolling, by waving the handlebar, actually trigger different patterns to go all the way up 100, 120 meters into the sky. And the form that those patterns would take and the way that the colors mixed would be determined by the way they'd actually assembled this shape in the first place. And then this one dropped down here. Here we have. which took nine people to control at the time. This took 200 people to control the time. And actually I'm relying on their combined weight to hold it down. So Sky Air was really well tethered. The Verbal only had two tethers. And I relied on basically trusting the public not to let go. Come, come. So go through a variety of modes and they're triggering these patterns. Now there was a problem with this project. There was a fundamental philosophical problem with this project actually, which was that the people on the ground who were controlling this thing and creating these sort of lovely patterns floating through the burble, and we did this again and again in different guises in different parts of the world. Um, using infrared. The people who were doing that a cellular automata couldn't see the most beautiful patterns. Right, The best view was actually about 100 meters away. Um, and so in a sense it was a self-defeating project because the, you know, the, tapping into that desire for people to, 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 to do something, they had no feedback on what they were doing. So this was another thing that I took away from this project. And um, Oh, I didn't actually include photos here, but was anybody at the Barcelona um, Burble, uh, what's it called, remote control Burble? No, Burble control remote, no. Burble, hey, was anyone there? No. Okay, so I did it in Barcelona uh, two years ago, three years ago, two or three years ago, um, down at the bottom of the, of the Ramblas, and there what we did was we created this, we created the, the cloud, but this wasn't publicly assembled. Instead, we asked everyone to come out with their remote, controlled, remote controls from their televisions. And the idea was that they could paint on this massive surface. And the combined, basically the sort of Harry Potter magic wands of 2,000 people created the patterns across the surface of the burble. And so the idea here was to take this thing that's normally a very static sort of individual act alone at home clicking choosing TV channels and turn it into something that becomes a sort of social phenomenon, something where you're collectively creating uh, an experience. I totally forgot to include photos of that here which would have been uh, which would have made sense. Um, we did a version for the 
Dubai World Cup, which was actually the least interesting, but there you go. Um, the Reconfigurable House was a project that I started, uh, I would say, probably in like 2004, 2005, and it actually began with a PDF pamphlet that I produced with Adam Somlai Fisher, um, some of whom you may know as Ether Architecture, others as the founder of Prezi. Um, I love his stuff and I love his work, and so we've actually worked quite a lot over the years, although not really in the last four years. We produced this pamphlet because we were getting used to basically hacking these really cheap toys and gadgets for their sensors. And we realized that, um, that th this is basically a very quick way for less technical designers and also just kind of again like normal people to start to play with sensing phenomena out there. And so we made this PDF pamphlet, it's still available somewhere or other for download. You can, um, you basically learn how to extract from different toys the different sensors and wire them up to do things and then to create more complex systems out of them. Uh, one of the outcomes was this, um, was the brick. So I, again, I don't think I, I don't have the video here, but this cat, which was available for about one euro in Chinatown, um, is basically the sort of universal, universal interface device because it responds to touch and it goes meow, meow. Um, and uh, you know, if you clap, then its eyes blink. And so basically you have this sort of analog input as well as a you know, digital input and digital output in terms of its eyes. And you could take its eyes and trigger a fan with its eyes. And you, know, you could sort of clap from one side of the room and you could create a whole chorus of, pe uh, of um, penguins squawking and all these kinds of things. Um, now what we realized was actually that that when people started downloading the PDF and using it to create projects, they very often took one sensor and attached it to one device. So they would take the, the uh, like I said, like the cat as an input and have it trigger a, a penguin. Um, and what we'd always wanted was for people to, to be thinking about building far more complex, dynamic, interactive systems. And so the reconfigurable house basically came out of that desire, basically to say, okay, this is how we would have done it. And so we took the, the, the pamphlet and created basically a, a structure, which is a prototype house that was filled with probably 10,000 or more sensor and actuators. Um, we basically got container loads of toys from China into, um, into Hungary um, and hacked them and turned them into all sorts of things. And the idea here was to start thinking about you know how we, we hear a lot about the smart home that's coming and you know the, it conjures up these visions of a of a white seamless box that sort of talks to you in a slightly scary voice and when the light bulbs fail you actually don't know how to change the light and you've got to sort of you know order something online and perhaps some man in a white suit comes a couple of days later and screws in the light bulb for you. This is a reaction to that. This is the idea of trying to turn that all inside out and say actually you can build a massively censored environment, actually quite easily. Sure, it takes a little bit of soldering skill and, and, and whatnot, but by taking that and interfacing it with Arduinos, which are relatively easy to use microcontrollers, and to interface them to processing, which is an open source and relatively easy to use programming environment, you could actually start to build an interactive environment. And what we did with this was basically, as designers, we did not fix which sensors were connected to which actuators. Instead, we built this touchscreen system where the occupants, the visitors to this home, could draw to connect, to, to create their complex systems. So, for example, if you wanted to connect the monkeys to the mobile phone, then that could be like a burglar alarm because the monkeys detected when people walk in front of them, they go, hello, I love you. You'll hear the video in a second. Um, and that was picked up by a walkie-talkie that sent a signal to a mobile phone that through, um, through some other toy clicked the send button that would send you an SMS when somebody walked into your home. And so that was something you could just sort of draw, create by drawing together. Or you could take your MP3 player and plug it into the headphone input and if you wired up the entire house to that MP3, in, to, to your MP3 player, you actually had the whole house beating in time to your music. Um, so, <laughs> um, 
at the, I forgot to explain about the cats that by embedding them into resin, we were able to create these basically a really inexpensive touch sensitive wall that could send signals out but could also respond to light inputs coming in or, or inputs coming in and, and light up. And you can see here in the, the distance, that's the, that's the, um, the cat wall. So there were probably about 20 or 25 different まあ、猫、猫。これ猫。つけます。なんでどう横田のくれてこようかな。ちょっと待って。あ、いいよ。<笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑> So you'll notice something, which is that every single device, or almost every single device, is both a sensor and an actuator. And this is quite an important thing, because, and it was a realization that we had, that came about through the design process, which is that every time we talked, this is me and Adam, talked about how to, you know, what do we call this? Is a, is a cat a sensor or an actuator, right? Is it an input to a human being? Or is it an actuator that's actuating something over there? There's this, uh, the philosophical difference between a sensor and actuator requires the context. So in some contexts, the cat wall is an actuator. So in some contexts, it's a sensor. And so that's why you'll see that for all the descriptions of every single one of the, or almost every one of the, the, the sort of device categories, there's two different things that they can do. They can respond to inputs as well as provide some kind of output. Um, so we did it in, uh, we did a bigger version uh, a couple of years later in, um, in Belgium, which, which Belgium was apparently a lot more calm than Tokyo in terms of the way that people configured it. Um, now, when I, so I would do these projects in different parts of the world and, you know, you get very, very fond of your own work. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you know, you install something in another city, and then you go back home. And I, and I mean, I, I loved the reconfigurable house. I really did. I felt this kind of love for it, and and I wanted to know how it was doing every day. And I wanted to know whether it was working, whether people were visiting it, what were its sensor values, what you know, what was it, what what was connected to what. And I realized that this was something that had, that had happened to me again and again. I kept on doing these projects and then I'd leave them in other cities and I wouldn't sort of still feel connected to it. And um, I don't actually have some screenshots. Actually, I could, I could go there. I'll show you this. Why not? This is a little bit of history here. This is for people who know about Patch Bay, which is I'm about to, well, what I'm about to talk about. Um, so, what I did was I created this thing called Environment XML, which was basically a project uh, it's actually still live. This was probably deployed first in um, I think around 2005. It was basically a very simple system for taking the data from that environment and publishing it to the web in real time. And what I wanted to achieve was basically that every time I did a new project, I would just add a couple more lines of code to whatever I'd done, and that data would automatically be published to the web. And then back in London, I could either, I could just look at that data and try and understand something from it, or I could try and build some graphs, or I could try and visualize it, or more interestingly for me, I could actually take that data and use it in another project. And so having done the reconfigurable house in Tokyo, um, and then published it onto this website. You'll see that there were at this time, at the time I stopped, there were probably, yeah, there were about like 30 different projects here. Um, uh, 
I had a, another exhibition uh, a couple a month or two later in Boston, which was a chair in Boston and a replicated chair in Second Life, and they had this sort of interaction between them. And I realized that actually I could get that chair that was in Boston and also in Second Life to respond as well to Tokyo, to the house in Tokyo, by using the system, because both of them could publish the data to the web, I could look at it, I could connect up the different data streams and, and have them basically respond to each other in real time with really just only two or three extra lines of code in, in the project. Now, this, as I said, you know, I first built the prototype in 2005-ish um, and it became popular enough that around 2008 I spun it off as a completely different company um, which has now become something that I think a lot of you know as Patch Bay. It was called Patch Bay essentially because, um, you know, like an audio Patch Bay where you can plug anything into anything else. The idea here was that anything could push data to Patch Bay, whether it's a biosensor, an energy monitor, an air quality monitor, a pollution sensor, a vehicle tracking system. Um, all of these things could use the same generalized data broker to make that data available to all the other devices that might want to use that, that kind of data. Um, to give you an idea of, of the, the kind of spread we have now, it really is almost everywhere in the world. We've got so sort of tens of thousands of feeds now coming in from around the world, and we're dealing with about 15, 20 million um, data points per day. So everything you see here going up and down, this is publishing in real time from some device somewhere in the world. Um, Currently updating around 300 devices are pushing data every second. So th this is this is now something that's used by Arduino users. It's used by building management um, software. It's used by energy company. Uh, an energy products company has actually built an energy monitor that's that's Patch Bay uh, uh, Patch Bay powered. Um, and the idea is that this data is all available to be used by other people. So if I put my mouse over something here, then I can actually look at these different tags. I'll look, click electricity, um, and it will now show me 1,417 feeds for electricity. If I go to one of these devices, then I can see graphs of its usage. I can access that data in different formats. I can pull that data in real time and I could even build an application on it, or I could use that data, I could aggregate all the data from all the energy monitors. Um, uh, now, I did not include photos here. I'm realizing there's a few gaps here and there. But um, one incidence where Patch Bay really came into its own was following the radiation crisis in Japan last year. The government had been, um, of course, in response to Fukushima's leaking of radiation, it started to release uh, radiation data from around the country. But they were releasing it in PDFs. And those PDFs basically just had numbers in them. And the way it was measured was different from prefecture to prefecture. In some cases, measurements were taken 80 meters off the ground. In other cases, one meter off the ground. And they were only releasing these PDFs once every day. And the Japanese community responded um, by using Patch Bay basically to, to be the public repository of radiation data that was gathered by the citizens. So some people were creating Geiger counters that were pushing the data to Patch Bay. Some people were creating um, uh, web forms where if you had a Geiger counter you could then just go and type in the value for your, your location uh, and pretty soon there were let's see what we come up with now so now there's 2,700 feeds for radiation about 10 days or 12 days after the after the earthquake hit on Patch Bay there were about 2,000 feeds of data some of which were updating every minute now the data was, of course, not homogenous, right? There were different models. There were different ways that people were measuring. There were people who were probably measuring things in, you know, inside lead rooms um, and not knowing what it was measuring. But the fact, of the, the fact of A, having so many data streams and B, having public visibility on it meant that 
experts, because nobody at Patch Bay is an expert on radiation data, and even any one of these individuals is probably not expert enough in the hardware as well as the interpretation, as well as the radiation phenomena, as well as the health effects. Um, people started commenting on that data and they would leave comments on feed pages where the units were incorrect and say hey look I think that's that should be nano gray or that should be millisieverts not microsieverts and hey are you sure you're pointing your Geiger counter in the right direction because it my reading of that is you're pointing it at the ground not at the sky and, and these kinds of things so the second phase occurred where again members of the community started Um, Hayan, who's uh, one of the community members in London, created a map uh, which, yeah, I think it's still loading, um, basically color-coded the patch bay feeds, the real-time values, and marked according to whether, the, 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 not just the number, which was what the PDF values had produced, but, but, but its relationship to the average background public space Geiger counter readings. So this became something that, that gave you a little bit more of an understanding of what was being measured. In, the, in other words, in terms of health consequences, you could also click any one of these, um, these devices and again, pulling the data from Patch Bay, you could see the graph, how it had varied. You could go to the Patch Bay feed page and then you might even see more about that device. Maybe the owner of it had left some notes about how they set it up or what have you. The phase after that was, of course, then there were things like the um, uh, Winds of Fukushima was an Android app that another member of the community uh, created, which took your geolocation and the wind direction and combined it to give you basically an understanding of where the radiation would peak next. So you didn't have to have your own radiation device because you could just monitor the ones near you. The, the point of this was that Patch Bay is, is ultimately all about and trying to enable innovation in the community, in areas that we, the platform developers, will never have the expertise. It's simply there as a generalized data brokerage to make that data available so that other people can, can build things on top of it. Um, how am I doing for time? Okay, I'll wrap up. Um, jumping back to spectacles. Now, if you remember, I left off with Open Burbel, quite disappointed in the fact that the people who were controlling this thing, and probably the, would, in theory, have the most enjoyment, actually had the worst view of it. Um, and combined with a, a, a brief that came from the city of Santa Monica, basically that we're gonna have 50,000 people coming to this event tonight, on, on this night, and we want all of them to feel as though they're part of the interactive experience. That's how Primal Source came about, which is basically, um, I wanted to look at using voice as the actuator, because voice, you know, it's something very personal. It's very rare for you to really fully express yourself in public, right? To really just sort of tap into those primal urges. And I wanted to figure out how to harness the voice to create a spectacle that everyone was part of. That somehow everyone could understand their contribution to it. Um, so these were the drivers behind uh, Primal Source. And the other driver was to do something that was magical enough that people almost didn't believe that they'd experienced it. So the next morning they'd be a little bit unsure whether they, you know, was that real? Was it those photos? Are they photoshopped that I was there? Um, and so I decided to create a cloud above the beach of Santa Monica that would come to life with creatures erupting from the ground into this cloud that are created by the voices of the people in, in front of challenge here, which was to get the, the digital representation to respond so quickly and so directly in frequency, sibilance, rhythm, and volume to the voice that you knew which one was yours. Um, and so that involved 
involved a lot of work with PD and processing. Now what was interesting for me here was to, to walk around the crowd and see people commenting on each other's performance. And also trying to make sense of what was going on. So you'd see people explaining to each other what they were seeing in this. So the cloud would basically go through a number of different modes. Sometimes you were generating creatures, sometimes it would fall into another mode where where the creatures would be attracted to whichever part of the crowd was loudest. So you'd generate all these creatures that fly up into the into the mouth of the cloud and then they would fly back towards whoever was screaming the loudest. That so it, I basically programmed this to be a little bit like game, uh, a game where I could just very quickly iterate with new game levels. So this was something I did basically five minutes before we go, went on, uh, uh, went live, which was just a different way to try and create a 3D effect in that crowd. In that crowd. Um, Natural Fuse is a project that. Let's see, did I do this? So natural fuse is basically a plant with a power socket and with this project I wanted to create something on patch bay, built on patch bay that was again, you know, in the same way that I built reconfigurable house to try and essentially show how I would have done the PDF pamphlet, the stuff I would have made with the low-tech sensors and actuators PDF. Natural fuse was an attempt to say this is what I would build on patch bay. Um, because there were a lot of projects that were being built on Patch Bay that were simply about data visualization, or they were about connecting a switch in Boston to, uh, you know, to a light bulb in New York, and these sort of one-way linear interactions. With Natural Fuse, I wanted to explore uh, what I would call the kind of many-to-many -many interactions. So there's a plant with a power socket on it, and the power that's available to that socket is limited by the capacity of the plant to offset its carbon footprint. Now, you know, often we have we, we hear of these sort of carbon sequestration projects where you have trees that offset your carbon footprint. You grow trees to offset your energy use. With the natural fuse project, the idea here was that that plant didn't even have enough carbon capturing capacity to offset a low wattage light bulb, right? Because that single plant could basically only offset one-fifth of a low wattage light bulb. You needed five of these plants to offset a light. So what happens is that when you switch on the device and you want light, it wakes up and it looks out on the network, because it's built on Patch Bay, it looks out on the network to see if there are four other plants out there that are not currently being used to offset energy use. And as long as there are four others out there, then you can borrow their carbon capturing capacity and safely switch on your light without harming the carbon footprint of the, com of the community. Um, and it adjusts depending on what kind of device you're plugging in. Of course, a radio uses less electricity. Now, if, if your device or if the amount of time you end up having it on it does harm the carbon footprint of the community, then what it does is it switches off the device. If you've got it on selfless mode, it'll switch off the device before harming the, 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 the carbon footprint of the community. So you would switch on your light and 20 seconds later it would switch off. 
is available within the If it was very urgent that you have light, for example, because you heard somebody in your flat and you want to have the light and because you want to see who this intruder is, you could choose selfish. You could choose to be selfish. And in that case, if you harm the carbon footprint of the community, it sends out a kill signal to somebody else's plant. And it does this basically through a vinegar injection um, that does kill the plant. Now in actual fact what we do is we give every plant three lives, a little bit like a video game, and at every life that you lose you get an email as well as the owner of the plant that killed you gets an email. And you cc'd and you can start to talk about why did you do that, why, you know, what happened. Um, and and you can basically build up a social relationship around this energy awareness, if you like. You can still choose to be selfish. It's not a project that requires you to be selfless. Um, but one of the interesting things we found was, because we've now done it in, I think, four cities around the world. Um, we used to, we basically set it up as a shop. In every exhibition, we set it up as a shop. You come along and you rent a plant for two or three months, and you pay by leaving behind plants. So it's an economy of, of greenery, basically. Um, you have to leave behind uh, some carbon sequestration capacity, if you like, and you take this plant home. Um, and we had a demonstration device in the in the in the shop in the first one we did in New York, um, and in fact we did it in the second one as well, not realizing this. Um, the demonstration device that we left on in the exhibition almost invariably was left on selfish. People would come along and they would be like, tick, 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 ooh, let me be selfish. And they'd end up killing the entire network of plants. Like everyone's plants would lose a life because somebody in the exhibition left it on all the time. And what we realized was that when you have no accountability, because nobody knows who did that, then there's no reason not to screw with the system. This is a very important thing for me to have learned because what I realize is that, I mean, you know, these are normal people, right? They're, they're screwing with the system and probably in the way that almost anyone would, right? Just because they're like, ooh, this feels a little bit mischievous, I'm having an effect, I know. Am I having an effect? Who knows? Who cares? Right? This is the kind of thing that I think you have to be aware of as a designer of any kind of public participatory system. There's going to be people, always, not bad people, just normal people, who do things that really are counter to everything you're trying to do with your, your project. And you have to embrace that. And so that leads, lead, brings me to, just to wrap up, some of the things I, I think I've picked up over these, uh, you know, uh, uh, over these years. And that is that even when we know what the problem is, for example, congestion, and we know what the consequences are, which is, you know, things like increased energy use, worse air quality, um, aggravation, wasted time. Even when we know all these things, we still cannot easily, collectively, decide to drive in straight lines so that we all get to work quickly, so that we all, you know, use less energy, so we all do, you know. Simply giving people a picture of this as a final goal does not result, uh, uh, does not actually result in this. It'll still result in this kind of chaos. So if as a designer you have this idea of doing a pretty visualization of a wonderful street where people are hopping and skipping and you know there's kites flying and dogs in the street and you know and there's lots of uh, pedestrianized areas and there's sunshine coming through the trees and the air quality is beautiful. That does nothing to convince anyone to take that first step to become part of the project. So the first thing I think I've learned over the years is you just cannot rely on this end goal to be incentive enough to participate in the project because everyone is going to look and say okay I'm gonna put in work here but I know he's not gonna, you know, no, nobody else is gonna, I'm gonna put in all this work and nobody else is gonna be part of this. So instead what I've started doing is to try and think of it 
you know, I bear in mind my end goal, but I, I don't actually talk about it. You know, I don't really present that necessarily as part of the project. I try and think about these kind of short-term incentives where people can kind of build their own motivation to participate. Their own sort of, you know, their, their, their own sort of tools for, for trusting each other. And that might be something totally different to what it was that I had in mind as the end goal. So, another thing that I think I've picked up over the years is that it really screws up a project if you are requiring everyone to agree on something before you can start. Right? Anytime you get more than three people around a table, it's going to basically logarithmically increase the amount of time it takes for you to agree on things. So, you've got to design something so that just a little bit of participation, you know, maybe it's just sort of five or ten minutes of something, results in some kind of gain for them. Now, I spend a lot of time sometimes, you know, many years ago, trying to convince people to come along to my project, come along and have a, you know, it's going to be great, here's, you know, I haven't actually done it yet, but it's going to launch on this date and you're, you're going to enjoy it or you know you'll enjoy being part of it and I realized it was actually fundamentally I, you know this is just parenthetically fundamentally I'm incredibly lazy and so a lot of the things that drive me are just trying to make things easier on my on myself um, because I don't want to do so, so much work to try and convince people to to come to things and so one of my realizations was that it was actually more efficient for me to try and build tools for people to convince themselves to participate than it was for me to try and convince them myself. Now, right now there is this sort of, I'll call it a fashion for making data public, um, which, you know, I, I won't, you know, I won't, um, I won't criticize it too much. Um, uh, but when, when you simply make data public. I don't think that you necessarily engage the public in what that data is about, how it was collected, why it was collected, who collected it, why did they not collect something else. And so the, 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 the mere idea of making data public in itself is not that important to me. And this is something you know, I think we've gone on, gone on about again and again in the workshop. What's much more important to me is the idea of the public making data. Because by going through that process of crafting data, of identifying things that they're interested in, that they want to measure, that they want to be aware about, that actually helps them construct their own evidence, to construct their own sort of rationales for being engaged in something. Um, another thing that is driven by my laziness is that I would rather try and develop something that solves two problems rather than spending a lot of time solving one problem. Um, so very often there'll be things that somehow try and solve something in two completely unrelated domains. I'm being quite general here in these things simply because um, uh, I'm trying to, to give that sort of, uh, that, that, that sort of distillation of, of things that I've come across. But um, Almost at the end. So public spectacle is really useful because it attracts attention, really, right? It's something that people can stand back from and they see it on the edge of the horizon or they see it in their park and they go over and they ask questions or they see someone doing something and they want to find out more about it. So public spectacle is actually quite useful to try and engage people because it re doesn't require them to engage in something on a long term. They can get involved in it long term, but to, to kind of tempt them in, it, it doesn't actually require them to commit to things. The final thing, which I think is very important to me, is a reaction to this idea that design is about simplifying things. That the designer's role is to take something very complex and distill it or simplify it so that the public can understand it. This is something I fundamentally disagree with because I think that in many senses 
a lot of the crises that we are faced with, whether it's urban planning um, problems or whether it is to do with climate change, are the result of saying, oh, there's something really complex here, but I can simplify it into a, uh, a street map that sends highways through cities and that you know delivers this, but who cares about the other consequences? I think that the truly workable, useful propositions are those that are so complex that you actually can't explain them to all the participants. You know, that is almost a measure of a truly participatory design, is when it is complex enough and requires the input of so many different disciplines and the knowledge input of so many different disciplines that none of them can actually explain the project fully. And just in closing, I want to show the, the this was actually the proposal put forth by a workshop in Pakistan that I did a couple of years ago. This was to explain the project. Um, and it was composed of sociologists and urban planners and architects and all sorts of designers. I can't explain what it was. Um, but it had to do with the performance in the street and there were, there were fruit juice sellers and there were buses that made lots of noise and there were shopkeepers who were, whose Im economic impact was affected by uh, people honking and there were, you know, etc, etc. It was a very complex proposition that each of these people had some kind of domain expertise in and was then able to take that out and actually test it on the street. And through a combination of conversations, they began to trust each other's ex expertise and sort of say, okay, you know, I, I think that you know about that, but you know, I know about this area. And they were actually able to create a project that is almost indescribable, but which every single one of the participants felt achieved his or her goal within their own specific domain. So don't be scared by complex systems. Embrace them. Thank you.